Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you all for being here today and um, sharing the space. Um, so our the title of our session is Action, the Role of Scientists, Nonprofit Organizations, and Advocacy Groups in Securing Environmental Justice and Improving Health Equity. So when I was first approached, by the way, I'm Leslie Amkidos, and I'm a, an assistant professor here at the University of Maryland and also affiliate faculty at Johns Hopkins. And I'll tell you more a little bit about me a little bit later, but since I'm hosting, I kind of want to let my panelists talk a little bit first. When we were first approached about this, um, all of us, or at least some of us, are also used to giving presentations at scientific conferences where we talk about our studies, p-values, et cetera, and we're like, you know what, let's not do that because this is a different crowd and we have a mixed crowd here, um, local and state government, some from academia, uh, community, students, and so we kind of wanted to make it a little bit more organic, a little bit more of like an engagement discussion where you provide us with questions and feedback as well. And we're gonna talk about um, taking advantage of the great breadth of experience that all of our panelists um, have. Talk about our experiences and how we can use that moving forward to ensure environmental justice in different uh, communities that we've worked with in the past. So with that, um, I'm, gonna I'm gonna have each of the panelists introduce themselves um, and then we'll get started. So first we have uh, Dr. Ami Soda. Do you wanna introduce yourself first? Um, I'll go last since I'm hosting. Oh, okay. So, totally fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, my name is Ami Zoda, and I'm an assistant professor in environmental occupational health at George Washington University. And um, so I'm an environmental health public. I'm an environmental public health scientist. The broad goals of my work are to secure environmental justice and improve health equity through advancements in science policy and clinical practice. Um, I've worked alongside various community organizations for the past 15 years, using the scientific method to document and validate their concerns. I've addressed health risk um, from uh, poor housing quality, oil refineries, and other polluting industries metal ladle mining waste at toxic superfund sites, and most recently, toxic chemicals and beauty products marketed to women of color. Um, and um, the other thing that I'm, you know, I'm very committed to is communication, um, because even though I often speak in the language of data and numbers, good science alone is not enough to create social change. And I think all of us are really in the business of creating social change. Um, and I've realized over the years that um, that you know the translation and dissemination of science is just as important as doing good science. And so I'm equally committed to kind of innovation in the translation and di dissemination of science for public health policy and practice. Uh, I'm also committed to helping to teach and mentor the next generation of scientists who are able to work at the interface of science, social justice, and policy. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, before we continue, um, our panelists uh, kind of represent academia as well as nonprofit and advocacy. So next we have Ms. Christy Truesdale. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Christy Truesdale, the Deputy Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, and we are a national nonprofit based in DC. Our mission is to protect uh, children from environmental health hazards and promote a healthier environment. And we do this um, by stimulating um, and promoting science, which is that generated by AMI and, and others in, uh, in the field. But we also um, use that science and advocate strongly for child protective policies um, at the national level and occasionally um, at the state level as well. Um, we also know that it, it takes a while to build the political will. Uh, so. In the meantime, we also ed educate and raise consciousness um, with a wide variety of audiences um, on children's environmental health issues and on uh, steps that they can take to reduce exposures uh, to the children in their care. Um, and we can't really do um, meaningful and effective work um, without addressing and acknowledging the fact that uh, certain communities, communities of color, communities with low wealth, um, have disproportionate exposures. So um, addressing this throughout our work is a very important part of what we do at the Children's Environmental Health Network. And I'll leave it there for now. And next is Ms. Walkeria Poole. 
Well, good morning. Um, uh, my name is Valkyria Pu, as Leslie mentioned. I'm the president and founder of Centro de Apoyo Familiar, Center for Assistance to Families. So if you didn't speak in Spanish, those are three uh, words that you can know by the end of the day. Um, uh, my organization, um, we do a lot of environmental health. We actually started to do work in the housing industry. But we realized that a lot of the people that wanted to buy a home, we wanted to make sure they learn everything about the environment in the homes that they buy. So we do, after all these great ladies do all this great job in the national and also in the academia level, we try to bring it to the community. And so we have different uh, methodologies and different community that we engage, especially the Latino and the African and African American community, um, because we try to bring awareness <laughs> and education um, to this population. Um, we, we, this is something new with a lot of our culture. Uh, we don't, we never heard about environmental justice, many of us in our country growing up. So we need to bring this to the culture. We wanna make sure they get educated. And also that we bring, um, in addition to our awareness, that the new generation that is growing up, they're gonna be able to uh, be more focused about environmental, um, environmental issues and also be able to make right decisions. Um, and so we are working in a number of projects which we're gonna be talking about later on. And that, I'm gonna leave it as that. Oh, by the way, just wanna mention, my office is here in Prince George's County. We have three offices, one in the Northern Virginia in Fall Church and uh, another one in Massachusetts in the city of Lawrence. And lastly, it's me. So again, my name is Leslie Ampito Sanguilay. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Maryland at the Maryland Institute of Applied Environmental Health. Um, and I also have an affiliate appointment at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And a lot of my work overlaps with these amazing uh, women that we have on the panel today. Um, I, I am an environmental scientist, an exposure scientist by training. Um, I received my training at Berkeley where I did a lot of my work on farm work with particularly children, as well as kids in inner cities. And here being in the uh, East Coast, um, because I am Latina and bilingual, a lot of my work um, and passion has been focused on focusing Latino populations. Um, as well as, I mean, my general interest is looking at exposures among women populations, including low income minorities, including uh, African American, Latinos, mothers, children, and occupational populations as well. Um, while Kira is our community partner, one of our projects that we're working on, um, and I'm just like, I mean, I'm committed to the field. and to making a difference um, and trying to translate my science to empower our communities so that we can do something about it and increase environmental awareness, which is one of the topics that we'll be talking about a little bit later on. And like I was talking, uh, telling you about earlier, we want this to be a discussion, a conversation. We don't want this to be stuffy and us like just spinning information out to you guys. So I'm going to throw out a few questions to our panelists and we're kind of going to start to get the conversation going. If you have feedback, any questions, anything else you need to add, please do. We want this to be, like I said, let's have a conversation about this rather than us just spitting information out to you. Um, so feel free to stop us at any time. Um, so our first question is, to our panelists, is describe one or more successes that you have been a part of that has helped to secure environmental justice and or health equity. Yes, want to start? Well, I, I, I have to say we have had a lot of successes in the last, we actually started in 2012 to launch our first environmental health program. And, um, and we are very successful because of the number of people that we had been able to reach. We use a model that is the, the Promotora model, which for many of you, you probably familiarize. And what that is, is, uh, is for the promoter. Um, pretty much we use uh, community leaders um, and we train them, so we do training the trainers for them. And with that, we're able to have somebody that look like the population that we're trying to reach to be able to uh, bring awareness to the community. So the, I'll give you an example of two of the successful, uh, successful uh, projects that we've done. One on the stormwater issue here in, in Prince George's County, for instance. We have partnered with about seven faith-based organizations, seven churches. Um, um, the seven of them were um, uh, Latino based or, uh, churches. And so we use promotoras to train them. And our goal was to reach about 100 families 
support church and to be honest we were able to triple that number and the success of that is because we ensure that when somebody learns something they bring it to 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 the relative to their families and as i mentioned before for many of our families this is something that is new you know they had no idea that existed they had no idea you know or they probably had some sense of it but they just didn't know what to do about um you know in addition to that we have worked on asthma prevention how we can help kids specifically uh, my, my culture you go to one of our homes and you're gonna smell clot all over because they wanna make sure that in order to be clean, in order for the house to be clean, it has to smell like that. Guess what? They didn't know that that was actually becoming a trigger to the health of many of their kids. So bringing alternative, they didn't know that vinegar can change that. So giving them the alternative, bringing the awareness, but at the same time, you know what? These are the alternatives are out there. And just in one of our events that we have, we got a testimonial in one of the grandma actually that was saying her grandkid was asthma with asthma the whole time and for the last time the kid has been completely healed, uh, healed after she changed her, her habit and after she changed the chemicals that she used at, at, at home um, and so she shared that with so many other um, and so we ensure that that kind of information keep going. So we continue to see those kind of successes, uh, not only through the partnership that we have with the faith base, but we also have created good partnership with daycare providers. We make sure that the daycare providers, they, they learn about that issue, especially the, the home care um, providers, and they tell their moms uh, or their parents why, you know, what are the issues and what are the alternatives as well. Great. I didn't know that you worked with daycare providers. Um, that's wonderful. So um, we're a national organization, and so it's a little bit more difficult to sort of draw these direct connections between the work that we do and successes at the community level. Um, I will say um, that we provide technical assistance, training, <coughs> and uh, free resources uh, to national organizations, to trainers, to professionals who can then incorporate best practices in reducing children's exposures to hazards in their own work and then also share that with the communities that they work in. Um, and so one example that we use that really um, gets into communities is uh, our Eco Healthy Child Care program. Um, this is the only national program that does provide technical assistance training you know, through the Train the Trainer program that we run. Um, resources and also um, does work to affect the marketplace as well. So we offer a uh, Eco Healthy Child Care endorsement program uh, for child care providers throughout the country who want to go above and beyond what's required of them by licensing standards to create healthier settings uh, for the children in their care. Um, and we know that there's approximately 13 million children that attend some form of child care each week in this country. Some of them spend more than 40 hours a week there, um, and currently licensing standards aren't sufficient to protect them um, from environmental hazards. So we see this as very, very crucial work for the youngest of our kids. Um, since 2008, we've endorsed over 2,800 providers throughout the country. Um, we've trained over 1,300 uh, health nurse consultants and child care professionals who go and into their communities and train child care providers in best practices. Um, and we've been also working with the largest um, uh, accreditation organizations to incorporate environmental health within their accreditation criteria and standards. Um, and we're now uh, embarking on working with the um, National Association for Family Child Care to also do this. And we know that a lot of um, vulnerable communities um, the children are in family child care settings, so um, we're really proud of the work that we do in the child care field, and, and feel that that's um, one of the, the strongest ways that we get involved in community level change. Can you add, and only because I know what, can you add about like reaching two populations? Sure, Latino population. Sure. So we, um, you know, a lot of our trainings are to child care professionals who turn around and, and train folks in their regions, but we also um, directly. Uh, train child care providers and those are usually in under-resourced um, communities so uh, we have worked with Leslie um, 
actually, um, working in, um, you know, providing trainings to child care providers in U.S.-Mexico border communities uh, and other under-resourced communities. Uh, we've uh, provided trainings on tribal lands. Um, we've translated all of our uh, materials and our curriculum into Spanish. Um, would love to translate into other languages. It's just a matter of funding. Um, so, you know, we've done quite a bit. We've also put all of our uh, curriculum, we sort of condensed a five-hour train-the-trainer into a three, two-and-a-half to three-hour online course. So we recognize that folks, you know, might not be able to get to our trainings, whether they can't take the time off from work or they can't afford it or they don't have transportation. So we're making this now available to anyone um, so they can take it from the comfort of their home at any time um, and learn about best practices in keeping the kids safe. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, one study that I worked on several years ago. It's an example of a community-based participatory research study, and this is a certain kind of research methodology where instead of just um, researchers from you know academic institutions coming into a community to study them um, where the community has no input and they're only involved in providing data, this is an alternative model uh, where members of the community are critically involved in various stages of the research. Um, so um, in this particular example, um, we were, uh, it was designed to address the um, environmental and health concerns of um, residents in Richmond, California, which is a city in Northern California. It's um, right near Chevron Oil Refinery, which is one of the largest oil refineries in the country. But it's also near many highways and many um, small other small industries as well as um, a big port. So they were particularly concerned about pollution from um, the oil refinery. Um, and so we developed this, um, there were two uh, non nonprofits, uh, two universities, uh, and one of the nonprofits was also an um, environmental justice organization that does a lot of advocacy work in Richmond. Um, so we work very closely with CBE. Um, we train some of their residents to collect, uh, help us collect indoor and outdoor air pollution samples as well as dust samples. Um, they, they, you know, had input in what we actually measured um, to address the community concerns. Uh, we also looked at a adjacent community, Bolinas, which is kind of further up uh, Highway 1 as a comparison community. And um, so we collected this data, and then another thing that we did that was, was pretty different is we actively gave the data back to the community. So we did this in forms of community report backs where we had events with childcare and food and music and, um, and Spanish, active Spanish translators. Um, so that you know the community had ownership of the data. Um, we also did something that was really unique and that we, we gave individual, we put individual report packs. So we actually gave, we asked people if they wanted their results and then we actually told them what was in their air and what was in their dust. And we helped contextualize that both relative to what you see in a national population as well as the rest of the study and tried to help them understand what were potential health risks and what are some ways that they could reduce that exposure. And then we did interviews before and after that report back process. Um, so, you know, what, what were some of the impacts? Um, so, uh, at the policy level, you know, the, the community really felt this ownership of the data and actually used some of their data, this data in testimonies um, to city council when um, there were, a, it, as they were um, basically lobbying to prevent the expansion of the Chevron oil refinery. So, they made the argument that, like, you know, Chevron oil refineries' environmental impact assessments were only considering the incremental pollution that Chevron would make. But they were saying you can't just look at the pollution of Chevron, in, you know, as, you know, in isolation because our community ex is exposed to all this other stuff. And they were actually successful in, um, per, you know, it was they, you know, the advocacy resulted in a legal victory that blocked the refinery expansion. Um, and then there was also another way that um, our data ended up, um, this was kind of, it was almost like an unintended, unexpected kind of um, thing that we found. Because often when you do research, you have a question, but you can't, you know, you don't know what results you're going to get. And that's the thing about research is that, you know, it's all about having good methods, asking interesting policy relevant questions, but 
you know, if you do good science, you, you can't really, you know, you, you don't know what the answer is. Um, and so we also looked at a wide range of chemicals in consumer products. And we were studying these because some of them can impact how your hormones will behave at very low levels. And one set of the chemicals we were looking at were flame retardants. Um, because our, some of our colleagues had studied these on the, on the East Coast. And what we found was, we found that both Richmond and Bolinas had, at the time, the highest levels of flame retardants um, that had been documented in household dust in the world. Um, and so that was like a really surprise finding. And uh, we hypothesized that it might have to do with the unique uh, flammability standards um, that were found in California at that time, only in California, that basically said that any um, furniture with foam had to be able to withstand an open flame uh, for, I think it was 75 seconds. And the, the way, the kind of the cheapest way to do that was to add chemical flame retardants. And uh, this policy dates back to the 70s. And you know, it was a well-intentioned policy. So um, starting in the 1950s, there was kind of this upsurge of household fires in, in the US. Um, and people were really dying and getting injured and having their homes uh, destroyed. And it was one part because we all of a sudden had all this furniture made from oil products that were highly flammable. But the main reason was a lot more people were smoking. Um, and right, so they were like going to sleep with their half of cigarettes. And the tobacco industry was really smart because instead of like, what we should have done is address the cigarettes. They're like, let's address what's in the couch because that's what's on fire. So they made, you know, they were like, okay, let's start treating products with flame retardants, and they thought they were harmless. And then fast forward 30 years, we find out the stuff gets out of our furniture, out of our electronics, into the dust, and into our bodies, where it can affect how our thyroids behave and actually affect the developing brain of children. Um, and so uh, basically we did that research and then we showed the Californians also had higher levels of these chemicals in blood. And then we went on to show that the impacts were disproportionate, particularly among low income communities of color. In California, Lesium's work also kind of reaffirmed or verified um, some of those ideas. And um, I was in California at the time and got to kind of work with a coalition of advocacy groups, public health scientists, doctors, firefighters. They actually, because firefighters have really high, uh, they, they die a lot earlier than the rest of the population, they have really high rates of cancer, so they got engaged in this. Um, and, uh, you know, it took a really long time. It took like five years and multiple, like, uh, multiple kind of tries. But uh, eventually, we actually changed the way um, that flammability standards were written in California. So that like they were both safer, because the other thing that kind of came about as the health concerns of flame retardants grew was that you know, these flame retardants don't really do much in terms of actually stopping the fire. They give you three extra seconds. Uh, but they also give you a lot more carbon monoxide and smoke, which is what actually kills people. Um, so we were able to kind of, you know, help provide critical evidence and also kind of by, by, by kind of highlighting the disproportionate impacts, you know, it both um, helped engage justice communities in this otherwise kind of more environmental campaign. And, um, you know, we really tried to help kind of shift the message that, you know, if we change flammability standards, it's, um, it's you know, not just an environmental policy, but really it's a social policy because we could really uh, help ensure healthier development of some of our most vulnerable populations. Um, so, um, yeah. So. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to throw one quick example so that we can move along. But um, when I was back in California, I was part, still part of a group where, like I said, they their focus is following farm market children. They've recruited farm market children back in 1999, the kids are now turning 18, they're still following them. Um, so they took a lot of samples on the moms and on the kids and they're looking for different outcomes. Um, and so they also took a CVPR, community-based participatory research approach where they involve the community and they actually have a community advisory board with actual growers, um, and farmers, as well as the community. So kind of everybody representing um, their population and something that I like that they did is also like they would hold town hall meetings where they do, again, report back the results to their participants. 
Um, and in pesticide research um, and other as well, like when you're talking about occupation of populations, there's this thing called a take home exposure pathway. And as you can imagine from the from its own name, it means that basically you as a worker can take on chemicals to your home and then either, you know, you can, you're basically you're increasing the exposure of your family members, your significant others, by you bringing those chemicals on your clothing or on your shoes or even in, in dust in, that um, gets carried in your vehicles. They've actually tested for different chemicals in vehicle dust, in the clothing. And so one thing that this group does is not only educate their participants and you know the parents, but also the kids. What they do is that in reporting back the results they're trying to educate and teach the kids is that they do like puppet shows where they talk about like, hey, this is a pesticide, this is what we do. And if mommy and daddy get home from work, we don't go up and hug them, right? We tell them, we wait for them to take a shower, um, to take off their clothing, and then we hug them. And so it, at one of these town hall meetings, a parent gets up and he says, excuse me, excuse me. Um, and then our, you know, the principal investigator of the project goes, yes, and she goes, so you're the reason my kid doesn't hug me when he gets out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was funny, but not, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it was good for us because it meant that we're not only educating the parents, but we're also educating the children and having them become more aware of, hey, this could be a potential source of exposure to things that I shouldn't be exposed to. Um, but they were thankful, you know, we were teaching not only them, but their kids, and so they were actually implementing what we were teaching them, which was great. Um, and then, you know, fast forward, I was also like on a, on a radio show where it was like meant for Spanish speakers. And we actually had somebody call in and said, hey, I'm actually in the state and I want to thank you because you guys have taught us so much. And this was like not arranged, nobody made her call. And so it meant a lot because sometimes to a scientist, we don't get that, right? We don't know the impact that we have had in the community unless somebody tells us, thank you for what you're doing. Not that we're doing it to get the thank you, but it kind of keeps on motivating us to do what we're doing. I, I have a question. Uh, one of the buzzwords that's gaining acceptance in environmental activist circles is citizen science. Uh, my fear is that as uh, MDE officials here in particular are encouraging citizen science, uh, they see it as a lower quality of science than what certified scientists prepare, and that after citizens groups, community groups collect data, they're going to be told, well, that's just not good enough to really influence mm -hmm. us. So I have two questions for you, for all, all of you actually, because what each of you has talked about is not just the science side of things, but to get community activism. <clears throat> Number one, um, what can we do as we collect this data in citizen science efforts to be credible to community groups? And then what can we do with the data that we collect to make it credible to officials who have to rule on regulations and things like that. Well, I just want to start, but I mean, I think uh, what, just one thing I think you can do, so I think when you're collecting data, you want to have, you want to have some idea that, of accuracy and precision, right? And so, you know, um, like the example is like, you know, you ask somebody how old they are, and you know, I remember my friend's daughter was like, you know, I'm six years and three months, right? But really she's like four, right? So she was very precise, but she wasn't accurate, right? And so um, some things that you can do are take duplicates, you know? So you want to be able to see, like, if you actually try to replicate the same, like, you want to try to see if you, re if you try to replicate your measurements, how close would they actually be? And those type of things, will give other people more confidence in your in the numbers that you produce because that, that's what, that's ultimately when you collect data you, you want to know how confident should i be and what i'm actually measuring and so there there are ways to do that like another thing that we often do when we collect data is we try to collect blanks just to see like you know how much contamination is there in my measurement whether that's an air pollution measurement which a lot of citizen science efforts often address air pollution. So you kind of want to just know if you're collecting it in a filter or something else, like what's what's just the background contamination and then what is your signal above that contamination? 
So those are just like two very simple things you can do. It, or I guess three. One is make sure you calibrate your met, your instruments often. You know, collect duplicates, collect blanks. These are all called quality control, quality assurance. And I think these kind of efforts will go a long way in giving yourselves confidence, community activist confidence, as well as any experts that you're trying to, to share the data with. I agree. And like Ami was saying, you want replication, right? You want to make sure that it's not just a random thing that you're finding on a given day, that if there is something that's polluting heavily the community, then you're seeing consistency so that you can show, look, this is not a one-day thing. This is what we're seeing. Look at all these repeated measures. We're seeing the same thing. Something's going on. Something must be done. Um, and making sure that you're also using equipment that's going to be, you know, I don't know what the word is, but like respected, validated, you know, rep, you know, not just a mom and pop instrument, um, something that's been used uh, in the field. I I just wanted to add to that, and I, maybe some of some of you know have more information than I do, but I do know that there are there is a group that is advocating citizen science at the federal level, and there's also a lot of citizen science advocacy. You know, work that's being done um, with the Smithsonian. And one of the things that they're looking, that they have been looking at, is comparing the validity of citizen science to actual researchers. Um, and I know that thus, so far, you know, what I've been told anecdotally by the scientists is that um, it is the, the aggregate, of, aggregate amount of information that allows you to compare with you know, with, with great accuracy to the researchers. So citizen science usually gives you a lot of information. There is going to be some of it that is, you know, anomalous. Or, but when you when you compare it on aggregate, it compares very favorably to the research that's being the you know the experts who are t collecting that data. So um, so you might want to look at the at the federal citizen science that in the and the Smithsonian ones, and see if they have any of that research published in this. The EPA is actually, EPA, it very often goes out and gives grants for citizen science work. Mm -hmm. um, and I highly suggest that you involve us researchers, call us in and say, hey, can you look, this is what we have going on, can you suggest some protocols that we could follow, what do you suggest, or we've done this, what do you think? And they could also provide you feedback as to, hey, maybe you need to take these measurements, or this is the time of day that you need to take these measurements, or this is what you need to use, or they may have equipment that you could use. Um, and, and But another way to think about it, too, is maybe the role of citizen science is really to, like, um, gain attention to the issue. So maybe also the, the role is not for you as a community group to do the job that EPA should be doing, but rather to collect some preliminary data to shine light on a problem, you know, get a media article about it, and, you know, then kind of pressure the state to be to be actually doing the monitoring in the high caliber way that, you know, that, that, that where it needs to be done. You know, because that's another way of um, thinking about, you know, I think citizen science can have multiple roles, but it, whatever the, the role of it, you want to have confidence in what you're collecting. And there are ways to kind of evaluate the, the quality of your data. Agreed. I was going to say that as well. Um, um, that it could be used as a, a stimulus, um, but also, in a sense, training you know youth to get involved and to be interested in performing you know research um, and and in these issues as well. So it, it can serve you know multiple roles. Any other questions? Yes. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I um. In our community, we are involved in fighting the expansion of a cement batching plant that they want to do in the town of Bladensburg here in, in Prince George's County. And so um, it's been quite an educational experience from, for me personally in, in every aspect, frankly, political, community, and trying to get people involved in all of that. But I heard Destiny say something this morning. Um, she said it took six years for her to finally stop this plant surprised me. I didn't realize it was going to be that long a process. So my question, I have two of them, frankly, but my question is for, is it Dr. Zoda? Mm -hmm. How long was it before you all were able to get this legislation passed um, 
concerning the, the flame retardant. Flame, yeah, right. That took it took at least five years. Yeah, at some, least, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. I mean, we there were there were several repeated like there were several. Um, there was an assemblyman in, in San Francisco who kept introducing legislation. And I went and testified in front of the California state legislator several times. And I mean, it went nowhere in part because the chemical industry was actually paying yeah. state legislators. And when they FOIA the, the records, they found that, right? And so you know what, what tipped it? So a long ways, like as, as the years went by, more and more evidence on the health effects we're building, as were the evidence on that this isn't a really effective strategy. These chemicals aren't doing what we think they're doing. But really what the tipping point was, and this is why media is so important, is the Chicago Tribune did this amazing five-day series um, called Playing With Fire. And they really kind of not only focused on the health effects, but the corruption and the collusion between the tobacco industry and the, like, the chemical industry. And they attacked it from every angle. And it went viral. They won the Pulitzer Prize for it, and basically the media attention basically essentially shamed the governor into getting involved. And so then the governor essentially bypassed the you know the state congress and and kind of basically said you know we're going to create change and it's coming from the governor's office. But that media, you know, there was so the evidence really mattered, but it, it was really the media who took it was able to really kind of take it to that that next level of awareness and you know public concern and um, and so uh, uh, you know that's why I say that it's like good science alone often can't I so need your help to do yeah. we're, we're in this together really I mean it sounds cliche but without your help you can't move forward yes. I also want to say that hearing your comments particularly this who is it um, <coughs> has been encouraging for me because frankly, I was getting discouraged. I thought that at the most local level, we could accomplish something because we're all living in the same community. And of course, we all want to be living in a healthy environment, mm -hmm. you would think. But um, there, there are other considerations, and you mentioned some of them. But um, I was encouraged by uh, our strategy. This has been going on for about 18 months, and we finally come to the conclusion that we're resorting to two things that you mentioned in your presentation which was turning to the um, relig uh, religious uh, churches and also the schools. Because we're hoping that through um, getting the youth involved, who certainly have more energy than I have, I have a lot of health problems, but um, that that would be the, the thing that would tip it over, you know, and get us to uh, accomplish some of the goals that we want. But you know, it's really amazing that um, our elected officials at the most local level um, did refuse to do any kind of research to determine whether or not this was going to be healthy or detrimental to the community at all. They didn't really care. All they were interested in is this plant pays big money in taxes. And I said to them at the hearing, I don't care how much money they're paying in taxes. You can't pay enough to jeopardize my health and life. So, you know, that's not a factor. We can get some healthy businesses in this town. We don't need someone killing us. But they didn't want, they, you know, and of course, I noticed that now um, he's running for a larger office than mayor is now, and I, I, I'm not going to say, because I can't say definitively, but I know who's sponsoring him. Let's put it that way. So, but it just was such a shock that at the most local level, you're talking about a town of 8,000 people, that this, I know it went on at the state, and I had given up at federal, frankly, because I used to work on Capitol Hill. But um, um, it, it's just really sad. So, so and also to speak to that gentleman's question about the citizen science, we have um, uh, used the services of Dr. Wilson, who's the organizer mm -hmm. of this thing, to assist us in setting up the citizen science projects and the training that's going on. So that's where we are now. So it's been really encouraging to hear that we're on the right path, we're going in the right direction. The idea that it would take five or six years is kind of sad, mm -hmm. but at least the outcome can be positive. And I must say, Recently, the county council voted to delay ruling on this very issue. Of course, I'm politically sophisticated enough to know that they're waiting to after the election. But, um, <laughs> so I'm not quite, I can't be, you know, 
secure in my own thoughts that um, that gives you time. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, we figure we could work it too. You know, I mean, I mean, but you know, if you have the knowledge, and you can operate on that knowledge. But if you're ignorant of it, you just think, oh yes, well, there is. I know what it's all. And I and I guess uh, that's why collaboration is so needed. And that's why uh, what? collaboration, yes. partnership, and getting getting the numbers. And uh, and as I said, you know, and I keep repeating that our culture, you know, our the community that we have, especially in Prince George's County, they are not they're not aware of what is going on. So we need more of us to get the the boys out there to let them know what's going on and what we can do about it. And now social media is huge, you know. So if we involve the youth, they always on Facebook, they always in Twitter, you know. So we need to take that for that, you know, advantage. And you know, sometimes we say we don't we don't have the resources to do that. But you know what? If we can use this model, training the trainer, and I'm telling you, it's been we keep proving it over and over that if you train two, you know, two or three people very well, they will replicate that. You know, and we're gonna be able to touch, um, you know, the mass. And also, when dealing with, especially when, in our case, with dealing with the churches, with the pastors and and the faith base, we 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 train and we meet with the pastor, with the leaders, the key leaders, they need to understand the issue. Because if I have a good promoter, a good promoter in that location, if the pastor who's the leader of that church and that community doesn't know the importance of the issue, nothing will happen. So when I'm dealing with a promoter, I'm also dealing with the, with the leaders. And I train them at the same level. And I make sure that they can be the, the support behind um, for the community leader who's going to be providing the information to that to that church or community. Uh, clearly, policy changes uh, have the biggest impact on public health. But as you point out, that takes quite a while. And I wonder, while, you, while you're focused on the long-term gains from policy change, whether you also concentrate on some uh, prevention uh, options that people can use. I liked your example of, of the clothes, but maybe they need to take the clothes off in the field and throw them in a bag in the back of the truck so that they, they don't even get as close as, right. as, as the house. Uh, but I wonder if there are other, other smaller things that individuals can do and whether you focused on those and tried to train people to do those. Second thing is, uh, you know, uh, we now have fake media, but we have fake science as well around the whole issue of climate change. And I wonder if that's impacted you when you've made your presentations at public meetings, whether people are skeptical. But do you want to speak first to like the individual? Sure. Stuff? So, you know, as I mentioned, we have a, a whole <laughs> curriculum on training child care providers, but it really does translate well to families and parents as well mm -hmm. on, on, you know, simple, free to low cost steps that they can take to reduce exposures um, to children, harmful exposures that are commonly found in child care settings and homes, um, from, you know, what safe, what safe plastics to use or not to use, you know, exposures to lead through food and water and paint and soil and dust. Um, you know, a, a whole variety of, of uh, environmental hazards in, in home settings and child care settings. So we do address that because we know that it does take time to achieve um, success at the policy level. Um, the other thing to consider um, about, you know, um, successfully um, seeing a policy come into place is that that's just one step, right? Um, the other key uh, important thing is that the, the policies need to be enforced. They need to be implemented and they need to be enforced. So there needs to be um, funding uh, to the agencies that are in charge of those regulations and things. And so that's the you know often the second piece that isn't all you know often addressed. So um, I think there's a number of factors there that sometimes get overlooked. But yes, we do provide um, at least um, on the national level, and then we share it with our train you know our trainers. Um, throughout the country so that they can take um, actionable steps to their communities as well. And then on your second point, I mean, I think, you know, we're um, definitely in this era where uh, science is under attack more than 
we've probably seen in our in our lifetimes. Um, and so, especially if you do environmental public health science, because right, you're challenging a lot of people's business models and profit models. Um, and so, uh, you know, you always like I talk to so uh, I mean, one, you always publish in good peer review so, uh, journals because then you you know, you stand behind that independent evaluation of your work. But I, I talk to the media a lot, and I mean, you always have, like, uh, people, like, in my case, from the chemical industry that are, you know, trying somehow to poke holes in your work. And, you know, I think I'm probably on, like, the junk science, you know, website. And you know, that means that you're getting somewhere, though, if you're on those websites. So, um, you know, and, and I think um, at least one thing I do is, I mean, so some scientists just don't talk to the media because they're just worried about well, they're, where their stuff get taken out of context, or you know they they they're like worried that their work will be sensationalized. But I think it's so important because we have talked about awareness and consumer edu you know just education and like the media is so important to translating your work. So I, I do a lot of it, but I'm very very careful about how I talk about my work and the words that I use and like. You know, just because I know that people are just waiting, you know, wanting to poke holes in what I say, or you know, basically show how it's not accurate. So I, you know, never try to like speak outside of what my study says or my science says, even if like reporters will push you because they want the sensational quote, or you know, they, you know, they want, they want to say that this is gonna kill everybody in ten years, and you know, and that kind of stuff, and. Uh, and so it's it's really your job to to be able to, to be that bridge and, and and to contextualize it because we really are, you know, uh, science is you know the value of science right now is under question, and so I think as I see one of my roles is to help people, you know, to justify why investing in science is truly a public good that is worthy of taxpayer dollars. Could you tell me what are the referee journals that you respect in your field? Uh, so, well, one is Environmental Health Perspectives. It's an NIH-affiliated journal. It's also open access, so anyone can can read stuff in it. And what? Just I'm not sure who else who else is in the crowd, but by peer review, we mean that we submit an article, and it may take three, sometimes six months. Sometimes a year, right? Sometimes yeah. a year, and it's being reviewed by scientists that have, they may know you, but they have not worked in that, in that particular study, and they kill it. I mean, they criticize it. They're like, what about this, and why didn't you look at it this way, and you're making this big conclusion here based on this, like, so it's checked. Like, we, it's the checks and balances that we need as well, and it makes, it only makes our studies stronger and our publications stronger. I mean, by the time we're done and they're published, they're even better than what we originally submitted. And they're anonymous reviews, so you don't yes. know. You don't know. I'm a scientist, so oh, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So. I had a question, uh, Wakira. Um, one of the principles of environmental justice and health equity is ensuring that all voices are heard. So I was wondering in your work, how have you ensured that subgroups within the dominant groups are heard? and are there any scientific evidence or strategies that you can use to bring both the dominant and the non-dominant groups to the table to discuss environmental justice? Maybe you can start. Uh, well, <coughs> I'll, I'll, unfortunately, some of the work that we do sometimes is limited to the funding that we get. Um, and our funders, they decide who, who we cannot target. In our case, we target the Latino community um, and the low-income community. Um, and we have, um, you know, we've been very successful in in our work in dealing with the faith-based community as a niche. So uh, we got over 200 churches, for instance, that we work with here in the Washington Metro. So we able to reach out to the Latino faith-based and kind of bring, um, you know, bring the education and or, or the work that we do through through that way now. We try to connect with national organizations so that we can also take the data that we collect to a national level. And so together we're able to have a larger impact. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's starting, we try to start small, 
but at the same time our goal is how can we take this to the next level so now for instance we're working with the university of maryland because as it's been another connection so we can also connect with the research you know how can we really how can it be a win-win there's some data that we can probably provide to them but there's also some research that you need our data or people to have a greater impact and so that's that's the strategy that we will use it now i know there's more there's more that uh there's room for for improvement there's room for to do even more i mean i have a lot of ideas and things that i know that it can work but there's only so much you can do based on the capacity that you have especially for a small nonprofit. profit So, um, how do you navigate finding media favorable to hearing your voice and elevating it? How have you been able to do that? <laughs> Can you speak? Yeah, again? so how are you able to find media that's favorable to you and be able to elevate your voice when there are concerns about specific things and uh, environmental concerns? Um, I mean, I, I work with my communications office and uh, I've also done a, like like various types of media training to to help me know kind of how, how to communicate in that way um, because I, I don't think it's it's not something we learn in graduate no. school, for example. But it, it's it's so important and um, and I think nowadays there's also so many new outlets. So I'm really into like I kind of think it's fun to try these newer just kind of like you know, kind of these emerging media sources, like podcasts, like I'm really into trying, you know, I've, I've worked, I've done a few podcasts with other people. Um, I, um, you know, I often talk to people who are writing blogs to help, um, you know, cover my work because those can be quite influential and sometimes they can go more in depth than like uh, ABC or USA Today that might just give you that one splashy article. So sometimes like, the smaller outlets that maybe are gonna kind of engage in longer conversations can can almost be uh, more impactful. So we um, usually get called when there's something in the news that's happening um, specific to children being exposed and, and we'll get a call um, from the media um, to provide some comments and things. We've tried to pitch things um, previously to media um, around success stories or solutions um, and those don't get picked up as much um, uh, which is unfortunate right you get calls when, when Flint happens um, but that's so that's kind of the difficulty is you want to highlight what's good in communities right um, what you know things are happening that we want to you know uh, emphasize and show as a model for other communities and those aren't usually picked up um, but that's the challenge right <laughs> Yes. So, um, to the to the woman who just asked the question about you know how do you find friendly media? Um, so I'm on I live on the lower eastern shore of Maryland and um, and I deal with poultry pollution issues and <clears throat> most of our media is out of the Salisbury area all the TV print media which has always been very friendly to big chicken. And you know when we started um, these campaigns about 10 years ago, it was very difficult for us to get our point of view out through the media. Even though we were, we took trainings in how to stay on point and make sure that we get our points across, no matter what the question is that comes back to us. By the time the editorial staff got through with things, it always came out as a favorable article to Big Chicken. However, we just kept at it. And granted, it's been 10 years, but in the last few years, um, the local reporters are actually listening to what people are saying, and they now started doing their research instead of just depending on what the poultry industry handed to them. Um, they actually are doing more research, and. In, you get both, you know, you're always going to get both sides represented in, in a news article, but um, the communities that are trying to um, protect their families and, and, you know, want clean water and healthy air, uh, they're actually, they're getting a voice now through the local media. So it just takes perseverance. 
So if you're in an area where you don't have friendly media, um, just keep at it. Because I have a follow-up question for you. Did you try to write op-eds, and were you successful? Would, would the newspaper publish your op-eds? Like, did you or anyone? It was difficult at first to get op-eds in the paper, but again, um, just because these local communities, we were helping them to host town halls. We were putting things in front of the media that the media had to pay attention to. And we brought like, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Jillian Fry from Johns Hopkins. And you know, we would bring, we had scientists there to speak. And we also had policy makers there to speak. And so they had to start listening to what was being said. So not only were we educating the media at the same time, we were also educating the greater community. Um, because for so many years, and, and so many families down there depend on the poultry industry that um, they really didn't want to hear, you know, the, the truth. And, um, and now um, people aren't so afraid to speak up and say something and, uh, you know, go on TV or have a quote in, in the paper or submit op-eds. And, and even at the local paper, the Daily Times, um, we do get op-eds published, letters to the editor get published, the local NPR station will bring in people and you know, have a Friday morning conversation. And so um, it's, it's just perseverance. And developing kind of long-term relationships with key reporters is like another way to do well, it. Well, except the losers where stuff. they come and go. <laughs> it's just, it's not like a big city. That's like, you know, they get out of college, they spend six months and they're off someplace else. But, um, but we have developed relationships with more regional papers like Baltimore Sun and uh, Bay Journal and things like that. So, yeah, that does, that, that helps too, to develop those relationships. Um, back there and then over here. So, so two things. Um, one about uh, media. Sometimes it helps, it depends on who's writing the op-ed. So I worked for Congresswoman Donna Edwards for a number of years and when I wrote something, you know, over her name or somebody, you know, somebody in the community wrote something, then it would get in the Washington Post or the Times or, you know, the Atlantic or whatever. So sometimes it depends on that. Um, now I work for an organization called NAPIA, the National Association for Equal Opportunity in Higher Education. We represent historically black colleges and universities. And I'm just wondering, what are some of the environmental justice issues on college campuses generally? Um, but also, um, how is it that you include student activists and what are some of their issues? I can comment to maybe one environmental justice issue. So, and this is through um, some work that um, one of our assistant professors here is Dr. John Payne Sturgis has done, so, and others have done. So they're starting to look at, you know, how many students are accessing the food pantry, right? And there's actually a lot, even some professors. Um, however, the issue with that, although wonderful they are getting fed, there's this issue that it's processed foods, it's canned foods, and there's a lot of chemicals that can in processed foods, and so it's sort of like, we feed or do we eat? So, that's something that we struggle with. However, there is research that's starting to move in that direction of like, hey, this is a problem. We need to address it. We, we, do, we don't only need to address the hunger issue, but we need to address the, like a healthy food issue, right? Not just giving somebody junk food or, you know, um, process and canned food, which has its own issues um, as well. Um, in terms of engaging students, which is one of the questions we have, it's funny, we only have like five or 10 minutes left and we, weren't, we got through one question, but it's okay. That's, that's a good sign. That, um, we try to involve students whenever possible, right? But it also depends on how interested the students are in our work and what their passion is, because you also don't want students who are just doing it for the, you know, to get something on their CV. We want somebody really, really need people to be passionate about this and do it, um, because that's what they really want to do. Um, so we try to engage students yeah. um, anytime possible. Like I have sometimes students, or um, they're interested in a topic and they talk to one of the professors and they're, they'll refer them to us. Um, and I'll somehow, and I'll engage in the research, whether it's like going on to the field, um, doing background work, like just something to keep it moving, because we're also, you have to understand that we're sometimes we're alone in doing what we're doing, right? We don't have like this big, huge network um, that we would love. We're working towards that, but sometimes it's just us, and so. There's capacity issues. Yes, there's capacity issues for us as well, and so anytime we can get the help, I mean, we welcome and encourage it. Um, we start little, but we're working. And, and the, I guess the two things that I wanted to add is 
I mean, this is very related to EJ in that, um, you know, we had um, some issues at George Washington University, you probably read about it in the Washington Post, where there was an instance on Instagram where, you know, members of the sorority um, were basically, um, you know, like um, hosting racist images. And then it kind of went, you know, whatever. It went, it was just, you know, distributed all over the place. And it really, 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 you know, it, be it became a really big issue because I think it uncovered the fact that a lot of students in co of color in, at, at GW just, uh, you know, are experiencing a lot of racism in a lot of different forms, um, subtle and not so subtle. And it really helped uh, highlight just some, <laughs> You know, it brought to the forefront some much needed conversations about our culture, our climate, and you know, in some ways we always think higher education has come so far, but then you realize that, right, that students of color still, you know, don't feel fully integrated and fully comfortable. And so, you know, I mean, I, I think that is also, uh, you know, very, very much an environmental justice issue to, to me. And so, I mean, it, it's come at a time where we're also, get, we just got a new president at the university, and you know, I think that they were very receptive um, to uh, these concerns and really tried to engage students. Now, will anything change? I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, um, and I know that um, at, at GW, I do a lot of work on health disparities, particularly as it relates to women's health and fibroids, and so, I'm really trying to create a model where I engage students from underrepresented, underrepresented backgrounds doing research on health disparities. And that's proven to, I mean, that seems, it's just, you know, it's kind of happened organically, but it's, um, you know, it's a really great way to engage uh, people in research that's affecting some of the communities. I, have a I just want to piggyback on that as well, because yeah. that was one of the questions. But real quickly, one of the questions was, how do we engage these communities to participate in research so that we can educate them and then kind of start moving the train forward? And one of them is, yes, you must, if you go, let's picture this, so you go into a room, um, I'm making it up. Everybody's from planet B, you're from planet A, they don't speak your language. You see one person who can speak your language, you're going to gravitate towards that person, not everybody else, right? Why? go against a current. So that being said, recruiting people in your studies as staff, as researchers who look like your population, who can relate, um, who can provide a different cultural perspective, right? Because you as a researcher may come in, you, you may have these ideas, but guess what? There might, there might be something culturally there that's going to prevent your intervention from working, right? Now I'm going to throw out an example. This was a real story. Um, they had washing stations in the fields for farm workers that were not being used. Turns out the water was cold and they were not using it because culturally they thought if I wash my hands with cold water, I'm gonna get arthritis. So it wasn't being used, it was a matter of like, hey, we need to listen, we need to apply culturally sensitive interventions, we need to listen to our populations. If I go in, I look like them, I speak their language, they're gonna be more open to talking to me. They're gonna say, you know what, somebody cares, there's one of us who cares. Because it may be that a person there that's not of their same culture or race, they still care. That's not saying that they don't care. Obviously, it's the research is getting done because somebody cares. But it kind of opens the honesty and the trustworthiness issue, and then it kind of makes them open up and tell you even more things that you may have not considered in your research studies. Yeah, I'll give an example of what didn't work, like the Human Genome Diversity Project, which became like a total just chaos. <laughs> A lot of communities didn't want to participate because of lack lack of trust. So. Yeah, yeah, that lack of trust is, is very is very real yeah. and mm -hmm. right. It needs to be acknowledged, right? It needs to be acknowledged, um, and that's why it's really important to involve um, researchers of color, minorities, yeah. in those populations because those are also going to be on the forefront of trying to get these issues out in the open, trying to gain the community's trust, um, so that we can start moving forward. And but right, you are. You don't want to just involve them to yes. recruit people. You yes. want to also give them skills to develop. <laughs> yes, that's and, what I meant. Sorry, to and, prepare them right. and build them so that they can then become future researchers engaging these communities as well and, and teaching others. And that's actually Absolutely. what I was going to piggyback because um, and, uh, we just had a meeting a few days ago with some of our funders. They, you know, they they keep saying that a lot of these events 
you don't see uh, volunteers that are coming that are people of color. And so, you know, and as I kept saying, you know, this is something that we need to really get our people of color aware of this. You know, we need to start working with the youth, with the kids, so they can get into this field, these professions, because unfortunately, you know, this is what it is. If we if we open up an event, and uh, we need professionals to come and do the kind of work that is needed from a science, you don't gonna find too many people of color who has the skill sets to do it. So it needs to start young, and you know, I'm so proud one of our uh, we used to have a youth promotora program, and out of those, probably I can't remember how many youth, but one of them is she's in her second year in college doing environmental health. You know, so we want to encourage people to really, because they, they don't know, and that's what I'm saying. 10, 20 years from now, we're going to see a difference, but it's because we are going to be tapping on the issue, we're going to bring awareness, and we're going to be reinforcing the issue to the community that we need to get them involved so we can see more people like us sitting in panel like this and getting, you know, wanting to be involved in these issues in the community. Um, and I would just say, you know, we have an internship program, so I talk to a lot of young people in, in college, um, and what I hear consistently from them is that they did not know about public health, environmental health, environmental justice. No one talks about that in high school. Um, they found out about it because they took a particular course in college that opened their eyes um, where they realized that, oh, I don't have to go into medicine or I don't have to, you know, I can focus on these issues. And so for me, I'm, you know, we're doing a dive. We're trying to find out um, what are all the curriculums out there, you know, K through 12. Um, and there's quite a number of them that have been created um, by, you know, I know NAACP has created a curriculum for K through 12. I know Duke University, Oregon State, you know, NIEHS has something. Yeah. But are they being used? What's the what's the uptake, and what's right. you know what are the challenges there? Because I feel like um, we've got youth. They're impassioned. They're smart. They you know we see that they can be organized, um, and there's a lot of power there, and um, they're the future, right? So I think that's sort of um, the question that needs to be addressed: is how do we help move that existing curricula? Um, forward. That, and that goes back to raising environmental health awareness, right? Because oftentimes yes. we can advise something, but oftentimes it's just not feasible, right? Because of costs. For example, like eating organic versus not organic. Yes, we know that organic may lower your exposure to pesticides, but can everybody afford it? Not really. And so it starts with empowering people with the knowledge, mm -hmm. right? So that then they can become demanding consumers of like, hey, this is, I want to eat healthier foods. And actually, some policies have been changed because of consumer demands and consumer pressure, not us. Like yeah. we provided the basic work, right. and then they ran off with it. Right. Um, so it's a team, definitely teamwork as well. And to to the point about how policy change is so long, and what can you do in the interim? Really, these for uh, some issues. I mean, I think local pollution lends itself to other strategies, but for some of these more pervasive chemicals that Leslie and I study, you know consumer demand for safer products drives changes in the marketplace, right? Mm -hmm. And that's so much quicker than, you know, sometimes state and federal policy change. Mm -hmm. um, so that with EPA. Right, mm -hmm. yes, right. And then they re the problem was the, the replacement the for the EPA. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just bad. So, um. <laughs> yes. Um, one thing I struggle with is that I feel very fortunate because I get paid to work on these issues and I, I'm always going out to the community because it's so important to have their voices be out front, but oftentimes they're under-resourced, they don't have the, the time, the money you know, to work on these issues. And I'm curious if any of you have had luck and you know the train the trainers models, which are so wonderful, to actually compensate them in some capacity or cover mileage or like if they're going to testify or if you've been able to work that into your efforts. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Please. Well, yes, um, definitely. We we do that in all of our grants when we put a grant out there and you know, we do some work with the promoters. We need to give them an incentive because you know they are volunteers. A lot of and again, you know, they struggle financially. Some of them they don't they don't they don't have the time or um, to to you know they have the money to cover their time. So in our in our model, we we do this. We give an stipend to the church, 
and the church provide an stipend to the promoter. And it is, it's not if they want to, it, it, is, it has to be written in the MOU with them. So um, we provide um, also um, malice reimbursement for the promoter. So all of our promoters, uh, they all receive a, um, a, um, an incentive and all the churches that we partner with, they do get a small grant out of what we get. So it's put in our budget. Was that put on by you or did you ask the funder to? Yes, it is part of the the proposal okay. to the funder. We asked them to, to you know, there is sub, a sub-grant, um, a subcontract that will be going to, um, to the promoter or to the church. In, in this case, we always do it institution to institution and they pass it over to the promoter that they identify. We're now doing a project with the University of Maryland where we're gonna be doing, working with health, health salons. And so the same thing, you know, part of, you know, and I told Leslie, you know what, it's only fair that we always get something to, um, to those promoters who's gonna be working. The hair salon owners probably won't get anything, but yes, the promoters, they will get something. So I think we need to wrap up, but um, like I said, we got through one question. <laughs> Some of us will stick around if you want that person to talk to us. Um, we're happy to talk to you, um, but we do have to wrap up out of respect for the next session going on. And I wanted to end with one quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, which says, never, never be afraid to do what's right, especially if the well-being of a person or animal is at stake. Society's punishments are small compared to the wounds we inflict on our soul when we love the other way. So, this is, we're going to be in business for a while, unfortunately. Um, this is, we have to do it together. You know, we can't do it alone. Um, we're a bunch of boutique shops trying to do, like, department low, right? <laughs> Great work, so we depend on all of you. Um, so, like I said, if you have any questions, we're happy to stick around and talk. Thank you for coming.